Section 17 of Exposition of the Apostles' Creed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA. Exposition of the Apostles' Creed by James Dodds. Article 4, Section 4, and Buried. Isaiah thus prophesied regarding the burial of the Messiah, quote, He was cut off out of the land of the living, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, End quote. In ordinary circumstances, the body of a crucified person would not have received burial it was the roman custom to leave the bodies of slaves and criminals who alone were subjected to this punishment suspended on the cross a prey to beasts and birds and when these and the elements had done their work upon the flesh the remains were ignominiously cast out the Jews, who inflicted capital punishment not by crucifixion, but by stoning, did not thus deal with the bodies of malefactors, but as the law directed, gave them burial on the night of execution. The presence of dead bodies in the neighborhood of Jerusalem during the Passover festival was regarded as a defilement, and steps were taken to have those of Jesus and the malefactors removed the jews could not themselves dispose of the bodies because they would have sustained pollution by contact with them and also because they had made over to the romans the execution of the death sentence Quote, the jews therefore because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the sabbath day for the sabbath day was a high day besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. End quote. This request was granted, but through the interposition of Joseph, a rich man of Arimathea, to whom, as a member of the Supreme Council, the resolution for the removal of the bodies would be known, that of Jesus escaped the ignominious treatment to which the others were subjected. He came and went in boldly unto Pilate, and craved the body of Jesus, securing it for an honorable burial, such as the Jews had not contemplated. Pilate gave the body to Joseph, and he bought fine linen, and took him down, and wrapped him in the linen, and laid him in a sepulcher, which was hewn out of a rock. It was a new sepulcher. Quote, where never man had yet lain. End quote. In Joseph's holy task, there was associated with him Nicodemus, who brought costly spices wherewith to embalm the body, quote, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. End quote. The disciples of Jesus do not appear to have shared in this work, which was watched from a distance by certain women from Galilee who followed and saw where he was laid. They, too, made ready spices and ointment with which to honor the body of the Lord. But when they came to the tomb on the morning of the first day of the week, they found it empty, for Jesus had risen. It is not without meaning that the tomb in which the body of Jesus was laid was a new one. It was thus impossible to affirm that any other than he had opened a way out of its dark recess, the conqueror of death. Such was the wonderful combination of circumstances that led to the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, quote, He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, end quote. The Jews desired that he should be buried with the wicked. When they besought Pilate to remove the bodies, they wished that Jesus and the malefactors should be laid together, 
if the jewish rulers had not parted with their right to dispose of the bodies the three who had been crucified together would have been consigned to the burying ground set apart for the interment of jewish criminals but it was the divine decree that jesus should make his grave with the rich and therefore the event was so overruled that the bodies of jesus and the malefactors were at the disposal not of the jews but of the roman governor who delivered the body of jesus to the rich joseph while therefore jesus was executed in such a way that but for the intervention of the jews and pilate and joseph he would have been buried with criminals quote, he made his grave with the rich in his death end quote. thus he who had humbled himself in dying was honored in his burial joseph and nicodemus were timid men the one was a secret disciple and the other through fear of the jews came to jesus by night though members of the sanhedrin they had lacked courage to defend jesus when he was under trial but now grown bold they identified themselves with him the sepulchre was carefully watched the jews thinking that they might hear something about the resurrection of him whom they called that deceiver went to pilate and made known their fear that the disciples would steal his body and say that he had risen from the dead the roman governor made light of their apprehension and said to them perhaps sarcastically quote, ye have a watch make it as sure as ye can End quote. Quote, so they went and made the sepulchre sure sealing the stone and setting a watch End quote. proceedings which eventually furnish strong confirmation of the reality of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. End of section 17. Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA. Section 18 of Exposition of the Apostles' Creed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA. Exposition of the Apostles' Creed by James Dodds. Section 18, Article 5, Section 1. He Descended into Hell. He descended into hell the third day he rose again from the dead. Section 1. He Descended into Hell It is somewhat startling to find in the Creed this statement regarding our Lord. He descended into hell. The clause, which was one of the latest admitted into the Creed, was derived from another Creed known as that of Aquileia, compiled in the 4th century. It does not appear in the Nicene Creed, but it has a place in the 39 Articles of the Church of England, where we read, quote, As Christ died for us and was buried, so also it is to be believed that he went down into hell. End quote. The Westminster Divines, who gave the Creed a place at the close of their shorter catechism, appended a note explanatory of the clause to this effect, quote, that is continued in the state of the dead and under the power of death until the third day quote. the word hell is used in various senses in the old testament sometimes it means the grave sometimes the abode of departed spirits irrespective of character sometimes the place in which the wicked are punished in the english new testament also the word hell has not in every place the same meaning it represents two different nouns in the original greek gehenna and hades gehenna was the name of a deep narrow valley bordered by precipitous rocks in the neighborhood of jerusalem 
which had been desecrated by human sacrifices in the time of idolatrous kings and afterwards became the depository of city refuse and of the offal of the temple sacrifices the other noun rendered by the same english word hell is hades which means covered unseen or hidden hades is the abode of disembodied spirits until the resurrection the jews believed it to consist of two parts one blissful which they termed paradise the abode of the faithful the other gehenna in which the wicked are retained for judgment lazarus and dives were both in hades but separated from each other by an impassable gulf the one in an abode of comfort the other in a place of torment as long as the spirit tabernacles in the body there are tokens of its presence in the visible life which is sustained through its union with the body but when it departs from its dwelling place in the flesh death and corruption begin their work on the body death is complete only when the spirit has departed and it is probable that this statement in the creed was meant to express in the fullest terms that christ's death was real as man he had taken to himself a true body and a reasonable soul and when his body was crucified and dead his spirit passed as other human spirits pass at death into hades it is not without a meaning that we read quote, when jesus had cried with a loud voice he gave up the ghost End quote. ghost is simply spirit and in his case as in that of every man there was a true departure of the soul from the body at death it was with his spirit that his last thought in life was occupied he knew that though it was to depart from the battered bruised tabernacle of his body it was not to pass out of his father's sight for his father's care Quote, father into thy hands i commend my spirit were his last words on the cross the descent into hell is not referred to in the westminster confession but in the larger catechism this statement is found quote, christ's humiliation after his death consisted in his being buried and continuing in the state of the dead and under the power of death till the third day which hath been otherwise expressed in these words he descended into hell End quote what the westminster divines meant was that while christ's body was laid in the grave his spirit passed from the visible to the invisible world that as he shared the common lot of men in the death and burial of his body so he shared their common lot in passing as a spirit into the abode of spirits the statement of this clause follows naturally what is said of the body of jesus in that which precedes it as his body was crucified dead and buried so his spirit passed into the abode of spirits Quote, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren those who maintain that the spirit of christ descended into hell in a sense peculiar to himself ground their opinion upon certain passages of scripture psalm sixteen ten quote, thou wilt not leave my soul in hell nor wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption End quote. is quoted in support of this opinion but does not really justify it it expresses the confidence of the speaker that god will not deliver his soul to the power of sheol the hebrew word equivalent to the greek hades or suffer his body to see corruption and in this sense the passage is quoted by peter as a proof from prophecy of the resurrection of christ ephesians four nine is also regarded as giving sanction to this view Quote, now that he ascended 
what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth End quote. by the lower parts of the earth some understand parts lower than the earth but such a view rests on a strained interpretation of the passage paul's argument is that ascent to heaven must have been made by one who before ascending was below christ had come down from heaven to earth and was below therefore he argues christ is the subject of the prophecy he has quoted he it was that had ascended up on high not the father who is everywhere in isaiah forty four twenty three we have corroboration of this view quote, sing o ye heavens shout ye lower parts of the earth End quote. here lower parts means simply the earth beneath that is beneath the heavens the most difficult and important passage bearing on the clause is first peter three eighteen and nineteen quote, being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the spirit by which also he went and preached to the spirits in prison End quote. in the revised version the rendering is not by but in which referring to the word spirit not the third person of the godhead but the human spirit of jesus in which spirit separated from the body yet instinct with immortal life he went and preached to the spirits in prison or rather to the spirits in custody the passage marks an antithesis between flesh and spirit in christ's flesh he was put to death his enemies killed his body but his soul was as beyond their power his body was dead but in the abode of souls his spirit was alive and active so far there is here simply the statement that our lord's disembodied spirit passed to hades but the apostle adds that he preached to the spirits in prison and it is inferred by some that he preached repentance but this is an assumption for which there is no scripture warrant we are not told what was the subject of christ's preaching he had finished his work on earth had atoned for sin had overcome death and conquered satan even angels did not fully know the work of grace and salvation which christ accomplished for man and it is not likely that the spirits of departed antediluvians and patriarchs understood its greatness the least in the kingdom of heaven knows more than the greatest of patriarchs or prophets knew while in the flesh they had seen his day afar off and as disembodied spirits they knew that messiah by suffering and dying was to work out their redemption but before the work was finished neither men nor angels understood the mystery of it and what is more likely than that the completion of his redeeming work was first made known to them in the spirit by the redeemer himself if we accept this view the preaching to the spirits in prison was the intimation to those already blessed who had while on earth repented and believed that messiah by dying had brought in everlasting salvation for his people there is still a difficulty in peter's words christ is said to have preached to those who were disobedient in the days of noah peter says that in the writings of paul there are some things hard to be understood but what he himself writes regarding christ's work in hades is also difficult and the passage has found a great variety of interpretations it would seem to imply that christ in the spirit carried a special message to the antediluvians who had been disobedient and had perished in the flood what that message was we are not told and human conjecture may not supply what the spirit of god has seen fit to conceal while the passage is a difficult one the inference is not warranted which some have drawn from it that those who are disobedient to christ and reject his gospel may though they die impenitent 
nevertheless obtain salvation after death the plain teaching of scripture is that it is appointed unto men once to die and after that the judgment and whatever the statement of peter may mean it does not sanction belief in purgatory or in universal restoration romanists teach that the department of hades to which the spirit of our lord descended was that in which dwelt the souls of believers who died before the time of christ and that the object of his descent was the deliverance and introduction into heaven of the pious dead who had been imprisoned in the limbus patrum as they termed that portion of hades which these occupied this they say was the triumph of christ to which paul refers in ephesians four eight when quoting the sixty eighth psalm he tells us that he ascended up on high leaving captivity captive according to the romanist hades consists of three divisions heaven hell and purgatory heaven is the most blessed abode reserved for three classes of persons first those old testament saints whose spirits were detained in custody until christ arose when they were led out by him in triumph second those who in this life attain to perfection in holiness and third those believers in christ who having died in a state of imperfection have made satisfaction for their sins and receive cleansing through endurance of the fires of purgatory hell is the abode of endless torment where heretics and all who die in mortal sin suffer eternally purgatory is supposed to complete the atonement of christ his work delivers from original sin and eternal punishment but satisfaction for actual transgression is not complete until after the endurance of temporal punishments and the pains of purgatory the church of rome claims the right to prescribe the nature and extent of such punishments and having devised a complicated system of indulgences penances and masses professes to hold the keys of heaven and to possess authority to regulate penalties and obtain pardon for the living and the dead such claims are unfounded and false god alone can forgive sin and he recognizes only two classes the righteous and the wicked here and hereafter and only two everlasting dwelling places heaven and hell the romanist doctrine has no authority in scripture but is of heathen origin being derived from the egyptians through the greeks and romans and having been current throughout the roman empire its effect has been the aggrandizement and enrichment of the papal priesthood and the subjection of the people it contradicts the word of god which declares that there is no condemnation to the believer in christ jesus that he hath eternal life that for him to depart is to be with christ to enjoy unalloyed unending blessedness protestants therefore hold that quote, the souls of believers are at their death made perfect in holiness and do immediately pass into glory end quote. between those who hold the doctrine of purgatory and believers in universal restoration there is not a little in common universalists reject the atonement and say that god always punishes men for their sins the wicked must expect to suffer in the next world but the mercy of god will follow them the punishment endured will in time effect deliverance and the result will finally be the restoration of all to purity and happiness they thus maintain with regard to all what romanists hold respecting those who pass to purgatory and both are to be answered in the same way we cannot make satisfaction and we need not for jesus has borne our sins in his own body on the tree by this quote, one offering he hath perfected for ever them that are sanctified End quote so that 
quote, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries, end quote. This clause has place in the creed as a protest against the heresy of Apollinaris, a bishop of Laodicea, who taught that Christ did not assume a human soul when he became incarnate. He thus denied the perfect manhood of Christ and in support of his doctrine appealed to the fact that the scripture says, quote, the word, in Greek logos, was made flesh. Quote, God was manifest in the flesh, end quote, while it is never said that he was made spirit. He sought to establish a connection between the divine logos and human flesh of such a kind that all the attributes of God passed into the human nature and all the human attributes into the divine, while both together merged in one nature in Christ, who, being neither man nor God, but a mixture of God and man, held a middle place. His heresy found many supporters though it was promptly met by Gregory Nazianzen, who showed that the term flesh is used in Scripture to denote the whole human nature, and that when Christ became incarnate, he took unto him the complete nature of humanity, untainted by sin. Only thus could he be qualified to become man's Savior, for only a perfect man can be a full and complete Redeemer. Man's spirit, his most noble element, stands in need of redemption as well as his body, for all its faculties are corrupted by sin. In affirming that Jesus descended into hell, this clause of the creed declares that he possessed the complete nature of humanity, that his true body died, and that his reasonable soul departed to Hades. End of section 18, recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA. Section 19 of Exposition of the Apostles' Creed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Exposition of the Apostles' Creed by James Dodds. Article 5, Section 2. The Third Day He Rose Again from the Dead. On the morning of the first day of the week, thenceforth hallowed as the Lord's Day, the Christian Sabbath, the soul of Jesus left Hades, and once more and forever entered the body, and formed with it the perfected humanity of the Word made flesh. The resurrection of Jesus is a well-attested fact of history. The close-sealed, sentinelled sepulchre, the broken seal, the stone rolled away, the trembling guard, the empty tomb, and the many appearances of Jesus to the women, the disciples, the brethren, and last of all to Saul of Tarsus, prove that he had risen. The resurrection was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Peter thus interprets Psalm 16, verse 10. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption, affirming that David, in that psalm, speaks of the resurrection of Christ. Jesus himself often foretold, both figuratively and directly, his own resurrection, as when he spoke of the coming destruction of the temple, and connected it with the death and resurrection of his body, or when he told the disciples that in a little while they should not see him, and again in a little while they should see him. The place which this doctrine holds in the Christian faith is shown by the numerous references to it in the epistles. The apostles had not grasped the statements of Christ in such a way as to lead them to look with confidence for his return, or to gather hope of his resurrection. On the contrary, they did not expect his resurrection, and when they heard of it, they could not believe it to be real. Yet, convinced by the evidence of their own senses, they came to hold it fast as the fact that crowned all their hopes in life and death. Although the preaching of Jesus and the resurrection exposed them to persecution and martyrdom, they nevertheless continued to proclaim a risen Lord. If Christ is not risen, says Paul, then is our preaching vain, 
and your faith is also vain. And he goes on to admit that if the resurrection had not taken place, he was altogether mistaken in the view of God's character set forth in his preaching and epistles. Peter makes a similar statement. We are begotten again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is his victory over death that confirms the truth of his claims. He is proved to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. So important a fact was it regarded in connection with their work, that when they met to select a successor to Judas in the Apostolic College, it was held to be essential that no one should be appointed who was not able to testify that he had seen the risen Lord. Paul regarded this doctrine as so necessary that he made it the basis of faith and salvation. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The life of Paul is an unanswerable argument for the truth of the resurrection. Not only did he preach this as the central doctrine of Christianity, he maintained it at the cost of all that before his conversion he had held dear. He was not a man to give his faith to such a doctrine without overwhelming evidence of its truth. As Saul of Tarsus, he had been in the fullest confidence of the Jewish rulers, and knew all that they could urge against the reality of the resurrection. But their arguments had no weight with one who had seen the risen Lord on the way to Damascus. The importance of the resurrection of Christ as an argument for the divine origin of Christianity is recognized alike by those who receive and by those who reject it. Negative criticism has assailed the doctrine and has devised ingenious theories to explain on natural grounds the testimony on which it is received. The diversity of such explanations goes far to refute them, and their utter failure to account for the marvelous effects which the appearances of the risen Jesus produced on the witnesses, or for the place which the doctrine held in their teaching, has tended rather to establish than to discredit the reality of the resurrection. Various skeptical theories, to which much importance was attached for a time, are now almost forgotten. The mythical theory fails to account for the immediate effect produced by belief in the resurrection. Myths require time for their growth and development, but the disciples of Jesus set the resurrection in the forefront from the very first. On the day of Pentecost, Peter sounded the keynote of apostolic preaching when he declared, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. And so from this time forward, with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. The historical fact not only rests upon the most irresistible evidence, it is the very cornerstone of the whole fabric of gospel teaching. Another view of the testimony for the resurrection has found advocates who claim that it explains, without having recourse to supernaturalism, the belief of the disciples and others in the doctrine. With some minor differences of detail, they agree in attributing the persistency of those who said that they had seen Jesus alive to the impression produced on them by his wonderful personality. This, they hold, was so strong that the effect continued after his death, and the disciples saw visions of him so vivid that they believed them to be real appearances. He had filled so much of their lives while he was with them that they were unable to realize his departure and retained his image in their hearts continually. Exalted and excited feeling projected his figure so that they saw him apparently restored to life. A theory such as this will not stand in the face of the evidence for the resurrection. It was no subjective impression, but the Savior himself, that brought conviction to the minds of the numerous witnesses. It was no apparition, it was a body that they saw and handled and tested and proved to be of flesh and blood. They heard their master speak and saw him eat and at frequent intervals for forty days he showed himself to them. Sometimes he was seen by one, sometimes by many, and before his ascension he charged them to carry on the work he had committed to them, to feed his sheep, to feed his lambs, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Him, said Peter, God raised up on the third day, and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. What they saw was the true body of their Lord, the same that had been crucified, dead, and buried. But a marvelous change had passed over it. It was now possessed of spiritual qualities, suddenly appearing, suddenly vanishing, now felt to be made of flesh and bones, 
and now passing through closed doors or walking upon water. It was no longer subject to natural law as it had been before the resurrection. And when the disciples beheld the Lord, they had not only proof of his continued existence, of his being God as well as man, and of God's seal having been set upon his atoning work, they had also an intimation of what life hereafter will be for his followers, who shall be like him, for they shall see him as he is. How full and widespread was the belief in the resurrection of Jesus in the hearts of those who were its witnesses is apparent not only from the fact that the great theme of their preaching was Jesus and the resurrection, but is also evident from the importance they attach to the Lord's Day and the Lord's Supper. These institutions have a direct connection with the resurrection, the former having been substituted for the Jewish Sabbath expressly on the ground that on that day the Lord rose. The latter, while it commemorates his death, sets forth also his resurrection life. End of section 19 Exposition of the Apostles' Creed Section 20 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Warner Exposition of the Apostles' Creed by James Dodds Article 6 He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. Forty days after his resurrection, Jesus charged the apostles, in the last words he is known to have spoken on earth, to testify of him throughout the world, and assured them that they should receive power through the descent of the Holy Spirit. This last recorded utterance called his church to missionary enterprise. Ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. It is when believers in Christ are faithful in the performance of this duty that fulfillment of the promise may be confidently looked for. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. We are told that when Jesus had spoken these things, he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Ascension is the completion of resurrection. If he were on earth, says the author of the epistle to the Hebrews, he should not be a priest. No part of his work would have corresponded to that of the high priest, who, when he had offered up sacrifice, passed into the holy place with the blood of the victim and laid it upon the altar. The act thus foreshadowed in the type was accomplished when our great high priest passed into the heavens and entered not into the holy places made with hands, which are the figure of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. The ascension took place in open day and in the sight of the apostles. While they beheld, he was taken up, that they might be witnesses of the fact. It was necessary that they should see him go up from earth. Unlike the ascension, the resurrection of Christ took place unseen by mortal eye. Eyewitnesses of his rising from the dead were not needed. The fact that they had seen Jesus after he rose qualified them to be witnesses of his resurrection. But it was only because they had seen him taken up that they could bear personal testimony to his ascension. Thus our Lord ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. This article expresses the honor and dignity of his person and character. To sit on the right hand is an honor reserved for the most favored. When the scriptures speak of the right hand of God, it is meant that, as the right hand among men is the place of honor, power, and happiness, so to sit on the right hand of God is to obtain the place of highest glory, power, and satisfaction. At God's right hand, our Lord entered into everlasting and perfect glory and dominion. Being one with the Father, all that is the Father's is His. He is exalted a prince and a savior, having an eternal life and all the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in Him bodily. The Father Himself gave Him the place at His right hand, having highly exalted Him, and given Him a name which is above every name. None can dethrone him or successfully plot against his kingdom. No weapon, carnal or spiritual, can ever prevail against him. It is this that gives to Christianity its stability and power, for Christianity is Christ himself sitting at the right hand of God. The ascended Christ exercises absolute authority and unlimited dominion. The Father, on whose right hand the Son sits, is, in this clause, as in that which stands at the beginning of the creed, termed the Father Almighty. 
though the distinction is not apparent in the english version of the creed almighty in the original greek is in these clauses expressed by two different words in the earlier clause the word so rendered signifies god's supreme universal dominion while here the word employed denotes the fact that his power and operation are always efficacious and irresistible and that all things are under his absolute control this word almighty warrants the belief which the clause declares that the son sitting on the right hand of the father possesses absolute and universal power and that in executing his office as a mediator none can resist or oppose him the word sitteth is expressive not so much of the attitude as of the settled and continuous character of christ's exaltation at god's right hand in heaven he executes the offices of prophet priest and king as he did on earth the prophet as teacher of the revealed truth held office in old testament times and when jesus entered on his public ministry it was as a divinely accredited teacher that he had claimed to be received he brought out of his treasury things new and old and exhorted men to hear believe and obey him by his words and his life he made known the will of god for man's salvation and when he was lifted up upon the cross it was to the end that by the sacrifice he offered and the truth he taught he might draw all men unto him he brought life and immortality to light and since his departure he has not ceased to be the teacher and the guide of all who receive him his word abides with us and his first gift to the church after he rose was the holy ghost who came to lead men to all truth when the lord ascended on high he received gifts for men and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of christ it is in him that all christian teaching originates and through his spirit that it takes hold of men's hearts our lord does not indeed now appear in visible form speaking face to face with men as he did in palestine but he speaks in and through every believer who in his name seeks to win souls for his kingdom paul recognized this when he wrote to the corinthians now then we are ambassadors for christ as though god did beseech you by us we pray you in christ's stead be ye reconciled to god in his exaltation christ executes the office of a priest the functions of the jewish high priest were not limited to the offering of sacrifice when he had made an end of offering he carried the blood of the victim into the holy place and made intercession for the sins of the congregation as the mediator between god and his people he thus foreshadowed the work of him who is a priest forever after the order of melchizedek succeeding none and being succeeded by none in his priestly office as the high priest work was partly without and partly within the holy place so christ's priestly work is twofold consisting of his satisfaction for sin upon earth and his intercession in heaven christ our passover is sacrificed for us he was once offered to bear the sins of many thereby satisfying divine justice and reconciling men to god after having as our great high priest offered the sacrifice of himself he passed into the heavens there he makes continual intercession for us at the right hand of god he exercises kingly prerogatives also he was anointed to the royal office at his baptism when the holy ghost descended on him when by death he overcame him who had the power of death when he rose from the grave and announced to his disciples that all power was given him in heaven and earth he asserted his kingly office and when god having raised him from the dead set him at his own right hand in heavenly places far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come all things were put under his feet he was given to be head over all things to the church and received dominion and glory and a kingdom he must reign until all his enemies are under his feet to which of the angels said he at any time sit on my right hand until i make thine enemies thy footstool end of section twenty exposition of the apostles creed section twenty one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by mark warner exposition of the apostles creed by james dodds article seven 
from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead this clause of the creed points to the future as those who saw jesus ascend stood gazing up two heavenly messengers in white apparel appeared and said to them this same jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven jesus himself often warned the disciples that the time was at hand when he should leave them and return to his father but that his departure was not to be final for he would come again to gather all nations before him and to judge the quick and the dead he comforted them by the statement that his going away was expedient for them i go to prepare a place for you i will come again and receive you unto myself but the return was not to be only for the reception of the faithful into his kingdom and glory but for judgment upon all mankind the son of man shall come in the glory of his father with his angels and then shall he reward every man according to his works behold he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him the time of christ's return to judgment has not been revealed of that day and hour knoweth no man no not the angels of heaven but my father only the first christians looked for it with joyous expectation believing that their lord and master would speedily appear and redress their wrongs cruelly persecuted by jew and gentile it is no wonder that apostles and other believers associated the second advent with emancipation and victory and termed it that blessed hope the glorious appearing of the great god and our saviour jesus christ under the influence of false teachers this expectation gave rise to unhealthy excitement and consequent disorder in the church in his second epistle to the thessalonians paul set himself earnestly to counteract their teaching he indignantly repudiated the doctrine attributed to him apparently in connection with a forged epistle and he supplied a test by which the genuineness of his letters might be proved the mistake of the thessalonians has often been repeated attempts have been made to fix the time of the lord's second coming and the work of predicting goes on busily still enthusiasts and impostors have been more or less successful in finding credulous followers again and again the progress of time has falsified such predictions but would-be prophets have not been discouraged by the blunders of their predecessors all men quick and dead are to be brought before the judgment seat the faithful that they may be raised to everlasting blessedness and the wicked to be dismissed to everlasting punishment paul describes the events of the great day of christ appearing as it will affect the saints the lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of god and the dead in christ shall rise first then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the lord in the air he gives a similar description to the corinthians we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed he commanded us to testify says peter that it is he which was ordained of god to be the judge of quick and dead and paul writes to timothy that the lord jesus christ shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing the most awful descriptions of the judgment as it will affect the wicked are given by the lord jesus himself in matthew twenty five we have a series of images in which the terrors of the great day of the lord are set forth the virgins that go out to meet the bridegroom the servants with their talents the judge dividing all brought before him as a shepherd divideth the sheep from the goats are warnings of the certainty and severity of judgment and of the doom reserved for the ungodly the father judgeth no man but hath committed all judgment unto the son as god he has all things naked and open before him as man he became subject to human conditions and was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin our judge knows our frame our temptations our weakness our difficulties and in the judgment as in his life on earth he will not break the bruised reed or apply to men's conduct a harsher measure than they have merited judgment will begin at the house of god and sentence on the ungodly will be severe in proportion to knowledge privilege and opportunity men will be judged by their works and in this doctrine of scripture there is no opposition to that of justification by faith men cannot be justified by their own works but if christ be in them and the spirit of god dwell in their hearts then being dead to sin they follow holiness the distinction between the children of god and the children of the devil is this that the former class bring forth the fruits of righteousness and the latter the fruits of sin a good man out of the good treasure of the heart 
bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. In the judgment the works of every man shall be brought to light, whether they be good or evil. There is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. The just shall be rewarded, not on account of their good works, but because of the atonement and righteousness of Christ. Yet their works will be the test of their sanctification, and the proof that they are members of Christ and regenerated by His Spirit. End of section 21. Exposition of the Apostles' Creed, section 22. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Warner. Exposition of the Apostles' Creed by James Dodds. Article 8. I Believe in the Holy Ghost. The eighth article of the Creed declares belief in the third divine person, the Holy Ghost. The words, I believe, implied in every clause, are here repeated to mark the transition from the second to the third person of the Trinity. While this doctrine underlies all the teaching of the Old Testament scriptures, it was yet in a measure not understood or realized by the Jews. And as Christ came to make known the Father, so to him we owe also the full revelation of the Holy Spirit. Prophets and psalmists had glimpses of the doctrine, but they lived in the twilight and saw through a glass darkly many truths now clearly made known. While we speak freely of spiritual life, our conception of it is so vague that we are apt to overlook or to regard lightly the work of the Holy Spirit in redemption. The disciples of John, whom Paul met at Ephesus, believed in Jesus and had been baptized, and yet they told the apostle that they had not so much as heard whether there was any Holy Ghost. John tells us that even while Jesus was on earth, the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. That the Holy Ghost is a person and not, as some hold, a mere energy or influence proceeding from the Father, or from the Father and the Son, is apparent from the passages of Scripture which refer to Him. An energy has no existence independent of the agent, but this cannot be maintained with reference to the Holy Ghost. He is associated as a person with persons. In the baptismal formula and in the apostolic benediction, the Holy Spirit is spoken of in the same terms as the Father and the Son, and is therefore a person as they are persons. He is said to possess will and understanding. He is said to teach, to testify, to intercede, to search all things, to bestow and distribute spiritual gifts according to His will. The Holy Ghost addresses the Father and is therefore not the Father. He intercedes with the Father, and so is not a mere energy of the Father. Jesus promised to send the Spirit from the Father, but the Father could not be sent from or by Himself. It is said that the Spirit, when He came, would not speak of Himself, a statement that cannot apply to the Father, and while Christ promised to send the Spirit, He did not promise to send the Father. The Holy Ghost is not the Son, for the Son says He will send Him. He is another Comforter who speaks and acts as a person. The Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. The arguments for the distinct personality of the Holy Ghost prove also that He is God. The baptismal formula and the apostolic benediction assume His divinity. The words of Christ with reference to the sin against the Holy Ghost imply that He is God. And Peter affirms this doctrine when having accused Ananias of lying to the Holy Ghost, he adds, Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Paul also asserts it when, in arguing against sins of the flesh, he affirms that the body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, and also declares of it that the temple of God is holy. Divine properties are ascribed to the Holy Spirit. Thus, omnipotence is attributed to Him. The Spirit shall quicken your mortal bodies. Omniscience, the Spirit searcheth all things. Omnipresence, whither shall I go from thy Spirit? Divinity is attributed to the third person in the statement that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Taken in connection with the other statement, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Ghost, and because of this, though born of a woman, he was in his human nature the Son of God. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Each of the three persons has part in the work of redemption. The Father gave the Son, 
and accepted him as man's sin-bearer and sacrifice the son gave himself and assumed human nature that he might suffer and die in the room instead of sinners and the holy ghost applies to men the work of redeeming love taking the things of christ and making them known till they produce repentance faith and salvation the father's gift of the son and the son's sacrifice of himself are of the past the work of the holy spirit has gone on day by day ever since the risen and glorified redeemer sent him to make his people ready for the place which he is preparing for them it is through him that we understand the scriptures and receive power to fear god and keep his commandments he comes to human hearts and when he enters he banishes discord and bestows happiness and peace then with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and the fruits of the spirit are manifested in his life the love of the father and the redemption secured by the son's incarnation and passion fail to affect us if we have not our share in the spirit's sanctification there is a sense in which the holy ghost comes nearer to us if we may so speak than the other persons of the godhead if we are true believers the holy ghost is enthroned in our hearts he dwelleth with you and shall be in you our bodies become the temples of the holy ghost it is through him that the father and the son come and make their abode in the faithful we are made a habitation of god through the spirit if any man have not the spirit of christ he is none of his when we consider the work he carries on in convicting men of sin of righteousness and of judgment and in converting guiding and comforting those whom he influences we can understand that it was expedient for us that christ should go away in order that the comforter might come if we are receiving and resting on jesus as our saviour then his spirit is within us as the earnest of our inheritance his presence imparts power such as no spiritual enemy can resist how different were the apostles before and after they had received the gift of the spirit one of them who before denied christ when challenged by a maid afterwards proclaimed boldly in the presence of the hostile jewish council we ought to obey god rather than men those who when he was apprehended had forsaken him and fled gathered courage to brave kings and rulers as they preached salvation through him the disciples who in accordance with christ's injunction awaited the descent of the spirit were on the day of pentecost clothed with power before which bigotry and selfishness passed into faith and charity and self-surrender and there was one on that day for the church a triumph such as the might of god alone could have secured a triumph which the ministry of the spirit whenever it is recognized and accepted is always powerful to repeat and to surpass all good comes to man through the spirit every inspiration of every individual is from him the lord and giver of light and life and understanding every good thought that rises within us every unselfish motive that stimulates us every desire to be holy every resolve to do what is right what is brave or noble or self-sacrificing comes to man from the holy ghost he is instructing and directing us not only on special occasions as when we read the bible or meet for worship but always if we will listen for his voice his personal indwelling in man as counsellor and guide is the fulfilment of the promise i will dwell in them and walk in them he will guide you into all truth is an assurance of counsel and victory that is ever receiving fulfilment and that cannot be broken end of section twenty two exposition of the apostles creed section twenty three this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Warner. Exposition of the Apostles' Creed by James Dodds. Article 9. The Holy Catholic Church, the Communion of Saints. Section 1. The Holy Catholic Church. In the clause of the Creed which expresses belief in Jesus Christ, He is called our Lord and in jesus christ our lord that he is their lord is declared by believers when they term the society of which they are members the church this word is derived from the greek kyrios lord in the adjectival form kyriakos of or belonging to the lord the scottish word kirk being therefore a form nearer the original than the equivalent term church the greek word translated church occurs only three times in the gospels in english the word is used in different senses all of them however pointing to the lord jesus as their source and sanction by church we sometimes mean a building set apart for christian worship 
the jew had his tabernacle in the wilderness his temple at jerusalem and his synagogue in the provinces the mohammedan had his mosque and the brahmin his pagoda but the christian has his church in whose very name his lord is honoured sometimes the word denotes the christians of a specified city or locality the church at ephesus the church at corinth sometimes it is limited to a number of christians meeting for worship in a house as in romans sixteen verse five and in philemon sometimes church denotes a particular denomination of christians as the presbyterian church the episcopal church sometimes it expresses the distinctive form which christianity assumes in a particular nation the church of england the church of scotland in the creed the holy catholic church means the whole body of believers in the lord jesus christ all who anywhere and everywhere are looking to him for salvation and are bringing forth the fruits of holiness to his praise and glory the lord jesus christ did not during his ministry set up a church as an outward organization he was himself to be the church's foundation but in order to be qualified for this office it was necessary that he should first lay down his life the work of building and extending in so far as it was to be effected by human agency must be undertaken by others after his departure he came to fulfill the law and so he was not sent save to the lost sheep of the house of israel he worshipped accordingly in the jewish temple and synagogues observed the sacraments and festivals of the old testament church and during his earthly ministry bade his disciples observe and do whatsoever the men who sat in moses seat commanded the faithful saying worthy of all acceptation with which the christian church was to be charged as god's message to the world was not yet published for christ had still to suffer and enter into his glory and the holy ghost had yet to be sent by the father before the standard of the church could be set up while the church rests on christ it is founded upon his apostles also to whom he committed the work for which he had prepared them and for which he was still further to qualify them by bestowing power from on high the gifts which he received for men when he ascended were needed to equip them for the work of founding that church which became a possibility only through his death and resurrection applying to them the redemption purchased by christ the holy ghost wrought in and with them and crowned their labors with success the christian church was set up on the day of pentecost when the holy ghost came down upon a band of believers assembled at jerusalem waiting for the promise of the father under his inspiration peter preached the first christian sermon with such power that the same day there were added unto the church three thousand souls the church is termed the holy catholic church when the epithet holy is applied to the church it is not meant that all who profess faith in jesus christ and are in connection with the visible church are holy or that any of them are altogether holy our lord taught that while in the world his church would contain a mixture of good and bad he likened it to a net in which good and bad fishes are caught and to a field in which wheat and tares grow together though all are called to be saints there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not the sanctification of believers is the work of the holy spirit effected not by a momentary act but by degrees and never perfected in this life upon all who truly receive the lord jesus a change is wrought by the holy spirit of god which results in holiness looking unto jesus they behold as in a glass the glory of the lord and are changed into the same image the transformation which they undergo extends to every part of their being the subject of sanctification is the whole man the understanding will conscience memory affections are all renewed in their operations and the members of the body become instruments of righteousness unto holiness as believers are enabled to die unto sin they live unto righteousness being renewed in the inner man by the divine spirit they bring forth the fruits of the spirit their desire is after holiness for they know that the restoration of holiness is the end for which jesus died and for which the spirit works christ loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish now the church is marred by many blemishes but her imperfection is for a time only when her period of work and probation is accomplished she will be purged and perfected and will be a church without spot or wrinkle meantime she is the holy church because her head is holy and because she is called out of the world and consecrated to the service of god she is holy because she is the body of christ of whose fullness she receives and whose graces she reflects and because it is through her teaching prayers and institutions that the holy spirit usually works and influences men to follow holiness 
the ministry the preaching the sacraments the laws and the discipline of the church have as their end the turning of men from their sins and persuading them to follow holiness the christian church is a catholic church the word catholic means universal and implies that unlike the jewish church which was narrow and local requiring admission to earthly citizenship as the condition of receiving spiritual privilege the church of christ is coextensive with humanity and accessible to all the master's charge was that the gospel should be preached to every creature the church's field is the world and her commission sets before her as a duty that she shall go into all the world bearing the glad tidings of salvation the disciples did not at first realize this comprehensiveness of the new faith even after his address on the day of pentecost peter had not risen above his jewish prejudices it was not until after he beheld in vision the great sheet let down from heaven and was forbidden to regard anything which god had cleansed as common or unclean that the fullness of the gospel dispensation was understood by him and he discovered to his astonishment that god is no respecter of persons but that in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is acceptable to him the catholic church is one it is the holy catholic church one in its origin as the household of god built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets jesus christ being the chief cornerstone one body with one hope one lord one faith one baptism the distinctive marks of the true church are allegiance to one lord confession of a common creed and participation in the same sacraments the unity of the catholic church is quite compatible with the existence of separate organizations that differ in regard to details of government or worship there is no outward organization which possesses a monopoly of christian truth and privilege while all who hold the head stand fast in one spirit they are not all enrolled as members of one ecclesiastical body or subject to the authority of one earthly ruler their citizenship is in heaven not in rome or in any city of this world the claim asserted by the bishops of rome to be infallible representatives of christ and exclusive possessors of the keys of the kingdom of heaven to whom all men owe allegiance and whose decrees and discipline cannot be questioned without sin has no support in scripture which while it enjoins unity of spirit never prescribes uniformity of organization what the romanist claims for the pope is virtually claimed for the church by some who reject papal authority by the church they mean one visible body of christians under the same ecclesiastical constitution and government and they maintain that the right to expound with authority the will of god is vested in this body and that private judgment must be subordinated to its decisions to constitute the church they say there must be bishops at its head ordained by men whose ecclesiastical orders have come down from apostolic times in unbroken succession without this apostolical succession it is affirmed there can be no church no true ordination no valid or effectual administration of sacraments such a definition of the catholic church excludes from participation in the ordinary means of grace the whole body of presbyterians nearly all the protestant churches of europe and all who refuse to admit direct transmission of orders from the apostles as a primary condition of the church's existence carried to its logical conclusion it would exclude even those who maintain it for all attempts to trace back a continuous and complete series of ordinations from modern times to the apostolic age fail to show an unbroken line it is therefore not possible for any bishop or minister in christendom to be certain that in this sense he is a successor of the apostles the catholic church is not exclusively episcopalian or presbyterian or congregational it is found in all christian communities and maintains its identity in all it is said by paul to be made up of them that are sanctified in christ jesus called to be saints with all that call upon the name of our lord jesus christ in every place their lord and ours as it is not the pope that admits to or excludes from heaven so it is not the prerogative of any church to bestow or to withhold salvation the right of private judgment asserted and secured by the scottish reformers is one which we are not only entitled but bound to exercise we must search the scripture for ourselves that in their light we may prove all things and hold fast that which is good a famous saying of ignatius who first applied the term catholic to the church supplies the true description of a living church wherever jesus christ is there is the catholic church end of section twenty three section twenty four of exposition of the apostles creed this is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Exposition of the Apostles' Creed by James Dodds. Article 9, Section 2. The Communion of Saints. This article appears to have first found place in the Creed as a protest against the tenets of a sect called the Donatists, from Donatus their leader. He seceded, 314 A.D., from the Christian Church in North Africa, carrying with him numerous followers, and set up a new church organization, claiming for it place and authority as the only Church of Christ. Circumstances put powers of excommunication and persecution at his disposal, which he directed against those who refused to become his followers. Augustine was for a time a Donatist, but his truth-loving spirit soon discovered the real character of Donatus, and then he became his active and uncompromising opponent. It was probably as a protest against the arrogance of the Donatists, and in deference to Augustine's wish, that the clause was inserted. In this profession it is declared that the Holy Catholic Church is one not in virtue of outward forms, or even through perfect agreement among its members upon all details of doctrine, but because of the holiness of those who compose it. It refuses to excommunicate any who hold fast the form of sound words, and who adhere to one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all. It is a brotherhood of which all who have the Spirit of Christ are members. Differences in color, or country, or rank, do not suffice to separate those who are the body of Christ and members in particular. The spirit of Christian fellowship that marks the saints finds fitting expression in the noble words of Augustine, In things essential, unity. In things doubtful, liberty. In all things, charity. The primary meaning of the word saint is a person consecrated or set apart. In this sense, all baptized persons who are professing members of the Church of Christ are saints. In the New Testament, the whole body of professing Christians resident in a city or district are called saints, although some among them may have been unworthy, just as in the Old Testament, the prophets, even in degenerate times, termed the people of Israel an holy nation, that is, a nation separated from the rest of the world and consecrated to God's service. Thus, we read that Peter visited the saints which dwelt at Lydda. Paul speaks of a collection for the poor saints at Jerusalem, and writes letters to all the saints in Achaia, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, and to the saints at Ephesus. And Jude speaks of the faith once delivered to the saints. In these passages the title is applied to all who were in outward fellowship with the Christian church. The term saint is used also in a more restricted sense. As they were not all Israel who were of Israel, and as not every one that saith, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, so all who are enrolled as members of the Christian church do not lead saintly lives. And those only are truly saints who are striving to live godly in Christ Jesus, and to be holy, even as he who hath called them is holy. This clause of the creed expresses the doctrine that Christians ought to have fellowship one with another, and that there ought to be harmonious relations and stimulating communion between their several churches and congregations, such fellowship and communion as may lead the world to believe that they are one in Christ, and that, though compelled by circumstances to assemble in different places and to form separate societies, they are, nevertheless, all members of one body of which Jesus Christ is the head, all stones in one building, of which he is the chief cornerstone, all branches in one true vine, of which he is the stem, and all animated and directed by the same spirit. Thus regarded, the clause is a protest against the exclusiveness which often marks Christian churches, and is a recognition of the spirit of charity. The extent of this communion of saints is not revealed. Much of it is spiritual and is therefore invisible to us. God alone marks in full measure the fellowship of the churches, and is acquainted with the character and conduct of all their members. He knew the seven thousand in Israel who had never bowed the knee to Baal, and the real, though unrecognized, communion they had with one another in their common fidelity and prayer to him. But Elijah did not know how much true fellowship he had, 
when he denounced the idolatries of Jezebel, and pleaded with God for Israel. The ignorance of the prophet, who thought he was the only faithful Israelite, has its counterpart in our own times. God knows, but we do not know, how many faithful saints there are in the world who are in fellowship with one another because they are in fellowship with him. We are excluded by many barriers from the knowledge of our brethren and sisters in Christ Jesus. Natural and moral difficulties stand in the way, hindering this knowledge. Differences in language, in environment, in habits and modes of thought, and other limitations, disable us for truly gauging the character of those with whom we are brought into close contact. Communion is nevertheless real and true. The members of the Church of the Living God, however they may be scattered and divided, have communion in fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And being in fellowship with God, they are of one mind, and are knit together by common faith and mutual sympathy. They are all one with the same head, and they have all one hope of their calling. Our Lord brought life and immortality to light, and taught men that between the Church militant and the Church triumphant there is indissoluble fellowship. Those who followed holiness in this life are saints still in the life to which they have passed. In the epistle to the Hebrews, believers are told that they are come to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. While the clause was probably inserted at first to vindicate the doctrine of communion of saints in this life, it has long been regarded as extending to a communion subsisting between the spirits of just men made perfect, and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ who are still on earth. The passage last quoted justifies the inference that death does not suspend the fellowship which believers in Jesus Christ have with him, their common Lord. Death separates the soul from the body, but it does not cut off the dead from communion with the Father or the Son. He who is the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob is the God not of the dead, but of the living. Of the whole family of the saints, some are in heaven and some on earth, and between those who are there and those who are here, there is communion. Since the heavenly church received Abel as its first member, there has been unceasing fellowship between militant and glorified saints. Those who are here are shut out by the tabernacle of the body from the personal intercourse with the souls of the departed, but are yet in a fellowship with them that is very real and precious. The holy dead act upon the living, and, it may be, are reacted upon in ways we do not understand. Of Abel we are told that, being dead, he yet speaketh. Those whom death has taken do not cease to exert an influence on the lives of friends left behind. Their example, their good deeds, their writings, the undying consequences of what they did while on earth affect us. The veil which death interposes between us and them hinders us from witnessing their spirit life, and we know not whether, or in what measure, or how they contemplate us. We do not go to them to ask them to intercede for us with the Father, for we believe there is but one mediator between God and man. We do not invest them with attributes which belong to God alone. All that we are warranted to say about their relation to us is, that what is revealed does not forbid, but rather encourages, the thought that they are interested in us, and concerned for our happiness. If the angels rejoice over the conversion of a sinner, are we to think that the spirits of just men made perfect are strangers to this joy? They are within the veil, we cannot see them, but we know they are in communion with God. The condition of the departed saints is one of waiting as well as of progress. They have not attained to fruition. There are doctrines which to them, as to us, are still matters not of experience but of faith and hope. The souls of the martyrs seen by John under the altar were in a state of expectation, desiring and pleading, as when in the flesh they had desired and pleaded for the consummation of Messiah's kingdom. And from them the apostle heard the cry ascend, How long, Lord? Saints here, and saints who have passed through the valley into the unseen, must surely hold many beliefs in common. Both alike believe the promises of God, and anticipate the glorious consummation for which they wait and watch, when the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of the living God. 
They believe in the resurrection of the body and its reunion with the soul forever. They have common affections. Their love is given to the same God. They have community of worship, and have communion in thanksgiving, praise, and, may we not say, in prayer, for the overthrow of the kingdom of darkness and the advent of the kingdom of glory? As those who are still in the body keep the New Testament feast, they feel that there is fellowship between them and saints departed, seeing that they honor the same Saviour, glory in the same cross, partake of the same heavenly food, and look for the same inheritance of perfect blessedness. End of section 24 Section 25 of the Exposition of the Apostles' Creed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Exposition of the Apostles' Creed by James Dodds. Article 10. The Forgiveness of Sins. The Creed acknowledges God as the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth. But there is another relation which he sustains to his creatures besides those of Creator and Father. In Scripture, he is represented as the King, Ruler, Governor of the universe, who imposes laws upon all his creatures, and requires of them scrupulous obedience. With the exception of man, the visible creatures have these laws, from which they cannot swerve, within their constitutions. The planet never deviates from its appointed orbit. The insect, the bird, the beast, all live in strict accordance with their instincts. But, unlike them, man possesses freedom of will and power of choice. This freedom, if rightly exercised, is a noble possession, but, perverted, it is an instrument of destruction. The lower animals cannot sin, because the law of their lives is within them, constraining them to act in accordance with its dictates. Upon man, free to choose, God imposed law. With freedom of will he received the gift of conscience, which, enabling him to distinguish between right and wrong, invested him with responsibility, and made disobedience sin. That he can sin is his patent of nobility. That he does sin is his ruin and disgrace. The effect of sin is separation from God, who can have no fellowship with evil, for sin is the abominable thing which he hates, and on which he cannot even look. A breach, altogether irreparable on man's part, was made between man and his Creator, when the first transgression of the law of God took place. The impulses of every sinner, which only divine power can overcome, is to flee from God. Hence arises the necessity for reconciliation, and for the intervention of God to effect it. That the unity thus broken may be restored, Expiation must be made by one possessing the nature of the being that had sinned, and yet, by his possession of the divine nature, investing that expiation with illimitable worth, so that all sin may be covered, and every sinner find a way of escape from the power and the penal consequences of transgression. These conditions meet in the Lord Jesus Christ, and in him alone. That God might, without compromising his attributes, be enabled to bring man back into fellowship with himself. He spared not his own son, and the son freely gave himself to suffering and death for the world's redemption. In the felt necessity of atonement, which has associated sacrifice with every religion devised by man, we have evidence of the universality of sin. All feel its crushing pressure, and fear the punishment which, conscience assures them, is deserved and inevitable. The heathen confesses it as he prostrates himself before the image of his God, or immolates himself or his fellow man upon his altar, and the Christian feels and confesses it as, fleeing for refuge, he finds pardon and cleansing in the blood of Jesus Christ. Sin is original, or actual, the former inherited from our parents, the latter, personal transgression of the divine law. Every man descending from Adam by ordinary generation is born with the taint of original sin. As a representative head of humanity, Adam transmitted to all his descendants the nature that his sin had polluted. The fountain of life was poisoned at its source, 
and when Adam begat children, they were born in his likeness. By one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. Death reigned, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Actual sin consists in breaking any law of God made known to us by Scripture, conscience, or reason. It assumes many forms. There are sins of thought, of word, of deed, sins of commission, or doing what God forbids, of omission, or leaving undone what God commands. Sins to which we are tempted by the world, the flesh, or the devil. Sins directly against God. Sins that wrong our neighbors, and that ruin ourselves. Sins of pride, covetousness, lust, gluttony, anger, envy, sloth. In many things we sin, and, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Man's sinfulness is set forth in Scripture by a great variety of figures. The word rendered sin means the missing of a mark or aim. Sin is sometimes described as ignorance, sometimes as defeat, sometimes as disobedience. The definition of the Shorter Catechism is clear and comprehensive. Sin is any want of conformity unto, or transgression of, the law of God. The taint of original sin, extending to man's whole nature, inclines him to act in opposition to the law of God, and every concession to his corrupt desire, in thought, word, or deed, is actual sin. Because of it, he is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Sin is always spoken of in Scripture as followed by punishment or by pardon. There is no middle way. Salvation for man must therefore involve deliverance from condemnation. The word which expresses man's liability to punishment is guilt. And only a religion which makes known how he may be set free from guilt will suit his necessities. We cannot set ourselves free from condemnation. Man, says the Confession of Faith, by his fall into a state of sin hath wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation, so, as a natural man, being altogether averse from that good, and dead in sin, is not able, by his own strength, to convert himself, or prepare himself thereunto. Forgiveness of sin must come from God. There is nothing in nature or in human experience to warrant hope of pardon. Nature never forgives a trespass against her law. The opportunity that is lost does not return. The mistake by which a life is marred cannot be undone. The constitution shattered by intemperance cannot be restored. The birthright bartered for a mess of pottage is gone for ever. And no bitter tears or supplications have power to bring it back. Whether we repent of it or not, every sin we commit leaves its dark mark behind. And in this life, at least, the stain can never be effaced. And yet, we believe in the forgiveness of sin through the grace of God. The forgiveness of sin is a free gift purchased by the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, who by his cross and passion obtained for men this unspeakable benefit, and commanded that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. In order that the grace of God may bring salvation, it is required that there shall be a repentance, in Scripture, repentance is set forth as necessarily preceding pardon. Jesus began to preach, and to say, Repent. Peter said unto them, Repent. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a saviour, for to give repentance to Israel, and forgiveness of sins. Repentance begins in contrition. Godly sorrow for sin worketh repentance to salvation. B. Before the good gift of God can be received, it is necessary that we confess our sin. It is when we confess our sins that we obtain forgiveness and cleansing. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To produce conviction and confession is the work of the Holy Ghost. He reveals to the sinner the sinfulness of his life, and so works in him repentance. C. Another requirement is unfeigned faith. 
he that cometh to god must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him without faith it is impossible to please him being justified by faith we have peace with god through our lord jesus christ let him ask in faith nothing doubting for he that doubteth is like the surge of the sea driven by the wind and tossed for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the lord d there must be also humble earnest resolution to be obedient to the will of god the forgiveness secured by the death of jesus is more than mere deliverance from the penalty of sin or the acquittal of the sinner it is the remission of sins the putting away of the sin with pardon there is a renewal of the inner man return to holiness is secured and the lost image of god is restored to man so that he dies to sin and lives unto holiness nothing less than this will satisfy the true penitent who asks for more than pardon whose cry is create in me a clean heart o god and renew a right spirit within me it is not sufficient to be set free from punishment there must be the abiding desire to have the life conformed to the divine will the grace of god that bringeth salvation teaches and enables all who receive it to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live soberly righteously and godly in this present world end of section 25section twenty six of the exposition of the apostles creed this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by michael fascio exposition of the apostles creed by james dodds article eleven the resurrection of the body animism the doctrine of the continuous existence after death of the disembodied human spirit has a place in the majority of religious systems but belief in the resurrection of the body is almost peculiar to the christian faith in old testament times the hope of immortality for body and soul seldom found expression job seems to have had at least a glimpse of the doctrine although his words in the original do not express it so strongly as those of the english version i know that my redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth and though after my skin worms destroy this body yet in my flesh shall i see god in the psalms there are various intimations that faithful servants of god looked for a future life in which the body as well as the spirit should find place isaiah prophesied thy dead men shall live my dead body shall arise awake and sing ye that dwell in dust for thy dew is as the dew of herbs and the earth shall cast out the dead. Daniel, still more emphatically, declares, Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. The story in the second book of Maccabees, of the seven martyr brothers, who would not accept life from the tyrant on condition of denying their God, proves that they were strengthened to endure by the sure hope of a better resurrection one of them thus confessed his faith thou like a fury takest us out of this present life but the king of the world shall raise us up who have died for his laws unto everlasting life another of the brothers about to have his tongue plucked out and his hands cut off holding forth his hands manfully said courageously these i had from heaven and from him i hope to receive them again their mother who is thought to have been one of the saints that in the epistle to the hebrews are said to have been tortured not accepting deliverance encouraged her sons to be faithful unto death by telling them that god who had given them life at the first would restore it i am sure she said that he will of his own mercy give you breath and life again as ye now regard not your own selves for his law's sake the pharisees in the days of our lord held by the doctrine which the sadducees who rejected belief in angels and spirits denied the belief expressed by martha when she said of her brother lazarus i know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day was in all likelihood current in her time it may have been to impress the truth of resurrection life for the body that enoch before the flood 
and Elijah, in later Old Testament times, were translated. But it is in the New Testament, in words spoken by the Lord Jesus, that resurrection is fully revealed. Marvel not at this, said he to the Jews, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear the voice of the Son of Man, and shall come forth. They that have done good, unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil, unto the resurrection of damnation. In reply to the Sadducees, who attempted to ridicule his statements regarding resurrection, he said, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. And he put them to silence by showing that the truth of resurrection was implied in the name by which God revealed himself to Israel. I am the God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob. He showed his power over the dead body, and furnished assurance of resurrection by raising the dead. He thus restored the daughter of Jairus, and the son of the widow of Nain, and raised Lazarus from the tomb four days after he had died. In his own resurrection we have the most signal pledge of our bodily immortality. When he arose triumphant from the grave, and showed himself alive by many infallible proofs, he manifested his power as the conqueror of death. It is clearly taught in Scripture that there is to be a general resurrection of the righteous and the wicked. In addition to texts already quoted, we find John declaring, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and the hell delivered up to the dead which were in them. And Paul writes to the Thessalonians, We that are alive, that are left unto the coming of the Lord, shall in no wise precede them that are fallen asleep, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The resurrection is associated with the second coming of Christ. It is his voice that shall awake the dead, and the angels who will accompany him are to gather them from the four winds of heaven to the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. In resurrection, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost take part. God the Father, who both raised up the Lord, and will also raise up us by his own power. God the Son, as the Father raiseth up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. God the Holy Ghost, who, as the giver of life, by his special action will raise our bodies. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. The Lord Jesus Christ is the meritorious cause of resurrection. By man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. His resurrection is the pledge and the pattern of ours. If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Christianity teaches that the body as well as the soul is redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the body. We are called to glorify God in our bodies, which are temples of the Holy Ghost, and we must give account for the deeds done in and through the body, as well as for those sins which are rather of the mind and will than of the body. The body will be raised and will be judged. God will bring to light all hidden things, actions forgotten by ourselves, deeds of which the world knows nothing, as well as those which memory retains and the world knows of. Before that great and notable day, our bodies, as well as our souls, must have been purged, else we shall never see God. The bodies of the unjust will rise, but theirs will be resurrection to shame and everlasting contempt. It is fitting that the reward or punishment should be the portion of the same souls and bodies that have been faithful or unfaithful. Christ rose in the same body as he had before his death, and so shall we. How this is to be accomplished we cannot tell, but with God all things are possible, and faith rests with confidence in his power and his word. We wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall fasten anew the body of our humiliation that it may be conformed to the body of his glory. While the body is the same as that 
in which the soul tabernacled, it will undergo transformation. Christ will renew the bodily as well as the spiritual nature of his people. Every part of their being will be transformed, and their bodies, like Christ's, will be spiritual bodies. We are to be sanctified wholly, our whole spirit and soul and body preserved blameless unto his coming. In this present life the body builds up a character which it will retain throughout eternity. Every act we do affects it, not for the time only, but forever. The lost soul will assume the polluted body, and while it may shrink in horror from the union, it will find no way of escape. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap, and the harvest will abide with him for ever. End of section 26 Section 27 of the Exposition of the Apostles' Creed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Exposition of the Apostles' Creed by James Dodds. Article 12. And the Life Everlasting. The great truth affirmed in the concluding article of the Creed is the life everlasting. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. This life will be the portion of all who are acquitted in the day of judgment, and they will then enter upon new experiences. Death and hell shall be cast into the lake of fire, and the redeemed, no longer subject to imperfection, decay or death, shall be raised to the right hand of the Father, where there is fullness of joy, to partake of those pleasures for evermore which have been purchased for them by the blood of the Lamb. It is interesting to note the gradual development of this doctrine, which was first fully expressed by him who brought life and immortality to light. We have the statement of the writer to the Hebrews that the faith of Old Testament saints had in view the continuance of life after death in a better country, that is, and heavenly. Whether this faith grasped the doctrine of bodily resurrection, in addition to that of the immortality of the soul, we are not told. It is remarkable that throughout the books of Moses there is an absence of reference to the future life as a motive to holy living. Prosperity and adversity in this life are set forth as the reward or punishment of conduct, leading to the inference either that retribution in the future life was not revealed, or that it exercised little practical influence. As time passed, the doctrine of everlasting life for body and soul emerged in the Psalms, and in the prophetical writings, but sometimes side by side with such gloomy views regarding death and its consequences, as to leave the impression that belief in it was weak and fitful. In the long period that passed between the time when Old Testament prophecy ceased and the advent of Christ, the fierce persecutions to which the Jews were subjected appear to have strengthened their faith in a future life of blessedness, in which the body, delivered from the grave and again united to the soul, shall participate. The author of the apocryphal book, termed The Wisdom of Solomon, thus records his belief. The souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, and no torment shall touch them. In the eyes of the foolish they seemed to have died, and their departure was accounted to be their hurt, and their journeying away from us to be their ruin. But they are in peace. For even if in the sight of men they be punished, their hope is full of immortality. And having borne a little chastening, they shall receive great good because God made trial of them, and found them worthy of himself. As gold in the furnace he proved them, and as a whole burnt offering he accepted them. And in the time of their visitation they shall shine forth, and as sparks among stubble they shall run to and fro. They shall judge nations, and have dominion over peoples, and the Lord shall reign over them for evermore. They that trust in him shall understand truth, and the faithful shall abide with him in love, because grace and mercy are to his chosen. Again he writes, The righteous live forever, 
and in the Lord is their reward, and the care for them with the Most High. Therefore shall they receive the crown of royal dignity, and the diadem of beauty from the Lord's hand. The happiness of the kingdom of heaven is in scripture termed life, because it constitutes the life for which man was created. Being made in the likeness of God, his nature can obtain full satisfaction, and his powers will expand into fruition, only when he enters upon a life which resembles, in proportion to its measure and capacity, the life of God. Jesus spoke of regeneration as entering into life. Those who receive the gospel message and walk in the footsteps of Christ are said to be born again, to receive in their conversion the beginning of a new existence, of which the entrance of the infant into the world is a fitting emblem. They possess now not only a natural life, but a life hid with Christ in God, which is a pledge to them that, when he who is their life shall appear, they also shall appear with him in glory. Knowledge of God the Father, and of Jesus Christ, imparted by the Holy Spirit, is said by our Lord to be life eternal. This is life eternal, to know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Standing at the end of the creed, this article expresses the consummation of the work accomplished for man by the three persons of the Godhead. The Father created man and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, that he might glorify God and enjoy him for ever. And when, through the fall, man had forfeited the gift of life, God spared not his own Son, that, through his dying, pardon and blessed life might be brought within the reach of the fallen. The Son assumed human nature and suffered and died, that he might deliver men from death, temporal and eternal, and procure for them everlasting life. The Holy Ghost, the giver of life, sanctifies the believer, and makes him meet for the inheritance of the saints. All the means of grace were given for the purpose of convincing and converting men, and of preparing them for entrance into and enjoyment of the blessed life in eternity. The everlasting life of the creed covers more than the immortality of the soul. Even heathens grasped in some measure the fact that the spirit of man survives separation from the body, but life for the body in reunion with the soul is a doctrine of revelation. In the pagan world various conflicting beliefs were held as to the condition of men after death. Some thought that existence terminated at death, others that men then lost their personality and were absorbed into the deity, and others that the spirit was released by death and then entered on a separate existence, possessed of personality and capable of enjoyment. But of the Christian doctrine of resurrection life for soul and body in abiding reunion, they were altogether ignorant. Those consolations which Christianity brings to the mourner were unknown. There is an interesting letter extant, which was written to Cicero, the Roman orator, by a friend who sought to comfort him after the death of his daughter Julia, in which the consolation tendered strikingly marks the distinction between the pagan and Christian views regarding death. Cicero was reminded by his friend that even solid and substantial cities, such as those whose ruined remains were to be seen in Asia Minor, were doomed to decay and destruction, and if so, it could not be thought that man's frail body can escape a similar experience. This is poor comfort in comparison with the hope of glory which sustains the Christian under trial. He knows not only that his soul shall live for ever, but that the life of eternity is one in which the body too, then incapable of pain, weariness, or death, shall have part. We know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, an house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Everlasting existence after resurrection will be the portion of the righteous and the wicked. Attempts have been made to explain away various emphatic scripture statements regarding the doom of the ungodly, with the view of lessening its terrors. But if we are to accept the plain meaning of these statements, there seems to be no reasonable interpretation of them which gives sanction to the belief that this doom can be escaped. What is called the doctrine of conditional immortality finds not a few advocates and adherents, who hold that existence in the future state is exclusively for the faithful, and that the sentence to be executed upon the wicked at death or at judgment is annihilation. A different belief, termed the larger hope, 
is maintained by others, who affirm that the punishment to which those dying impenitent are to be subjected will in time work reformation and cleansing, after which, restored to God's favor, they will enter upon a life of happiness. It is a strong argument against such doctrines that the same word which our Lord employs to describe the permanent blessedness of the redeemed is used by him to denote the punishment of the wicked. The reward and the punishment are both declared by him to be everlasting or eternal. The same Greek word is in the English New Testament sometimes rendered eternal and sometimes everlasting. The portion of the righteous will be life, life everlasting. That of the wicked is described as consisting, not in annihilation or interminable suffering, but in everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, and from the glory of his power. While this article may be regarded as bearing upon the doom of the ungodly, it is rather to be viewed as affirming the eternal blessedness of the risen saints. The everlasting life begins on earth, but is perfected only in eternity. It is sometimes spoken of as a present possession. He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Again it is spoken of as a reward in futurity. He shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, and in the world to come eternal life. Our knowledge of what that life will be is very limited. Human words cannot describe it. Human beings in this life cannot understand it. We know that it will arise from knowledge of God. Men will be equal to the angels who see God. Now we see through a glass darkly, but we know that, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Statements regarding the happiness of the saints are in Scripture expressed sometimes in negative and sometimes in positive terms. In the new heavens and the new earth the redeemed shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. There shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light. Pain and sorrow and death can never touch them. They shall be delivered from perplexing doubts, from all misery and trouble. Care and anxiety shall be banished for ever, and God will wipe away all tears from every eye. There are also many positive statements regarding the future life. Not only will there be the absence of all that is painful and productive of sorrow, those for whom it is prepared shall enter into rest. They shall possess abiding peace, and the joy of their Lord will become their own. Their bodies shall be like Christ's own glorious body, which, when transfigured on Tabor, shone as the sun and was white as the light. They shall be satisfied, when they awake, with the divine likeness. They shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and as the stars for ever and ever. They shall sit down with Christ upon his throne, and shall be rulers over cities. They are as the angels of God in heaven. In the many mansions of the Father's house there will be a place for every saint. Each will be rewarded according to his works. Some are to be raised to higher glory than others. Some are to have authority over ten cities, and some are to bear rule over five. But all the saints will be happy in the eternal enjoyment of God's favor, which is life, and of his loving kindness, which is better than life. End of section 27. Section 28 of Exposition of the Apostles' Creed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Exposition of the Apostles' Creed by James Dobbs. Appendix. The following arrangement is from Professor Lumby's History of the Creeds. It shows that the portions of the Apostolic Creed, which do not appear in the earlier forms, are very few. Irenaeus omits the conception of the Holy Ghost, while Tertullian inserts it. Neither creed contains the first part of the fifth article, and in both the ninth and tenth are wanting. With these exceptions, the substance of the Apostles' Creed was in circulation as early as A.D. 180. The Apostles' Creed 1. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth. 2. 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. 3. Who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. 4. Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. 5. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 6. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 7. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. 8. I believe in the Holy Ghost. 9. The Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. 10. The forgiveness of sins. 11. The resurrection of the body. 12. And the life everlasting. Creeds of St. Irenaeus, A.D. 180. 1. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, who made heaven and earth. 2. And in one Christ Jesus, the Son of God, our Lord. 3. Who was made flesh of the Virgin. 4. And in his suffering under Pontius Pilate. 5. And in his rising from the dead. 6. And in his ascension in the flesh. 7. And in his coming from heaven, that he may execute just judgment on all. 8. And in the Holy Ghost. 11. And that Christ shall come from heaven to raise up all flesh, and to adjudge the impious and unjust to eternal fire, and to give the just and holy immortality and eternal glory. Creeds of Tertullian 1. I believe in one God, the Creator of the world, who produced all out of nothing. 2. And in the Word, His Son, Jesus Christ. 3. Who through the Spirit and power of God the Father descended into the Virgin Mary, was made flesh in her womb, and born of her. 4. Was fixed on the cross under Pontius Pilate, was dead and buried. 5. Rose again the third day. 6. Was taken into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. 7. He will come to judge the wicked to eternal fire. 8. And in the Holy Spirit sent by Christ. 11. And that Christ will, after the revival of both body and soul, with the restoration of the flesh, receive his holy ones into the enjoyment of life eternal and the promises of heaven. End of section 28. End of Exposition of the Apostles' Creed by James Dodds.